first of all what i would like everyone to do is this pay attention to space right here and all the objects in it just do that for a few seconds So there is space and there are objects in it. As if space is the canvas and objects are the painting on it. Without space, objects won't be, right? In general, we just look at objects, we quickly interpret them and move on. We don't pay any attention to space, right? And now, now let's pay attention to silence. Always here. Sound comes out of it, goes back into it. Now listen to this sound. It's coming out of silence, going back into silence. It's coming out of silence, going back into silence. So there is silence and there is sound, especially when you pay attention to sound that comes to an end, like my sound, it's easier to become aware of silence. So sound comes out of silence, goes back into silence, comes out of silence, goes back into silence. And now let's pay attention to stillness. It's always here. This is another canvas. All the movements take place in stillness. Watch my hand. It's moving as if in the ocean of stillness. So by watching movement, you become aware of stillness, always here. So there is space, silence, stillness, always here. And here's the amazing part. When you are paying attention to space, silence, stillness, you will realize that there is no stress. Right? <coughs> In that moment, you are free of stress. So, stress comes in two forms. One is what we can call outer stress and the other is what we can call inner stress. So, outer stress is stressful situations, they come and go. Uh, somebody doesn't have a job, you are at LAX, your boss is mean to you, somebody is in the hospital, all those situations, stressful situations, they come and go. And generally that's what we think stress is, right? We think, you know, once uh, I'm retired, I'm free of this job, uh, kids have left home, they have their own families, then I will have no stress, right? Generally, what people think that once that outer situation is gone, 
then there will be no more stress, right? But it doesn't work out like that, right? <laughs> because even these external situations, they continue to come and go. As one goes, another one comes in, it just continues to go. In addition to that, even if you got everything that you wanted in the world, you got a mansion in Beverly Hills, you got a famous person, <laughs> you got everything going for you, but then why are you on sleeping pills? <laughs> right? Or you are on a vacation, you made it successful person, and uh, now you are uh, sitting on a beach in Hawaii, and you are still stressed out. The inner voice is going on. Why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? What if? What will I? Right? Familiar with that inner voice? Now, this is inner stress, and it's always there with you. Whether you are living in uh, South Central LA, or whether you are living in Beverly Hills, or whether you are sitting on a beach in Maui, that inner voice is always there. And that inner voice creates inner stress, which is always there. So not only you have outer stress in one form or another, in addition to that, you have this inner stress, which is always there. And actually, uh, this inner stress is even more harmful for your body because it is always there. In the middle of the night, there is nothing to solve. You are sleeping in bed and you are not sleeping. That inner voice is going on. Very harmful for the body. So this inner voice, we're going to focus on the inner voice, the inner stress. Why? Because the general stress management is very superficial. It's all focused on that outer situations that, oh, you're getting stressed out, it's your job, so take a vacation and you'll be fine, and you're not. You go on vacation and you're all stressed out there because of this inner voice, right? And you come back to the same situation and you're even more stressed out because you have to work harder to pay for the bills, right? <laughs> so, for that reason, we're going to focus on this inner stress because when you say that I'm stressed out, right, generally you'll find yourself say, oh, I'm so stressed out. Who is this I who is stressed out? So there are two components here. There's an I who is getting stressed out because of that external situation. So there is a situation and this I is responding to that. So those are triggers out there, right? The buttons, <laughs> heart buttons. So those are triggers, but who is getting triggered is me. So the whole focus of usual stress management is to change those triggers, change everyone else's behavior, or oh, it's your husband, so divorce him, <laughs> it doesn't work out. <laughs> you find another husband and then you are ready to divorce him too, <laughs> or it's your job, so change the job, right? And then a <laughs> couple of years later, you are to change your, you are ready to change your job again, right? So. Those are triggers out there. So if you stay focused on changing those triggers, you will never be free of stress. It's a very superficial approach to be free of those situations or those triggers. But who gets triggered is you. 
How about if you change you, then the triggers can be there, but if you don't react, then there is no stress, right? Make sense? So that's uh, how I look at it. That in real, the source of stress is inside you, not out there. Therefore, the real solution is also inside you, not out there. You don't have to change any person, any situation, anything out there. All you have to do is change yourself. Then those triggers are around you, you are not reacting to them. End of stress, right? So the next step is, how can we change ourselves? And before you can go there, you have to find out who is this I, right? Who is this I that is reacting to all these situations? Have you pondered on this? Who are you or who am I in real? You are not your name, right? Let's ponder over it right now. Are you your name? Of course not, right? In real, you could be Peter, you could be David, you could be Tom, whatever. That's a sound, right? Now, Tom is a sound, that's not you. It's a label, and to be more precise, it's a sound, right? That's not you. Yeah, it helps to function in the society, but that doesn't become you. You didn't come in this world and announce, hey, meet Tom, <laughs> right? When you're born, you have no name. So obviously, you're not your name, right? Are you your profession? Obviously not, right? Because you were you before you became doctor, engineer, lawyer, teacher, real estate agent, whatever, right? You were you. That's the profession you have, that's all, but that's not you. So to say that I'm Dr. Zaidi is actually not very correct. <laughs> but our language has become like this, that we pretty much have to say I'm Dr. Zaidi. Sometimes I feel like saying my name is Dr. Zaidi and I, I've done that sometime and the new patient will look at me it's like, what's wrong with him? <laughs> it's like it's how children, five, six years old, they tell, oh, my name is David, right? But when you're grown up and you have achieved something, then you, are, you don't say it's my name, you say, I am so and so, right? <laughs> so, just, just look at yourself, how, how that name, that profession becomes us, and it is not. So, we have a name, we have a profession, and then we also have certain uh, religious beliefs, political beliefs, social beliefs. That's not who you are. If you say, you know, oh, I'm a Republican, okay, you belong to maybe a party called Republican Party, and that's all, but that's not who you are, right? But see how people just say, I am so and so. So who is this I? It's a virtual I, right? It's a pseudo I. That's not who you are. It's kind of stealing your identity, it's as if it's the hijacker, steals your true identity. Right? Who is this I? Are you born with this? No. Very simple logic. At birth, you don't have a name. 
you don't have a profession you have no political social cultural ideas you have no information whatsoever and you are alive you are a full human being fully alive right no question about it and you can ask question any time you want by the way it's informal we are thinking together here that's all so at birth there is no name there is uh, no profession no beliefs whatsoever political social cultural no beliefs right as a matter of fact a newborn baby is not even thinking why do i say that cuz let's observe right now at this moment we are all thinking in terms of english right we are not thinking in russian or persian or in japanese or in chinese right we are all thinking in english right so in order to think you need a language very simple we are thinking and we are thinking in english if this was a crowd that knew japanese then we we'll all be thinking in japanese so in order to think you need a language you always think in terms of a language and at birth there is no language yet hence there is no thinking make sense that's why babies are not thinking because they are not thinking they are automatically in the now without trying to be in the now all they are concerned is their basic needs which is a full stomach a clean diaper and a warm blanket and that's it once those needs are met they are joyful from within and they are living in the now and they have absolutely no psychological stress right we all have experience of our babies and that's how they are yes every 3 hours you need to take care of this their basic physical needs and that's it then they are joyful playful from within because they are not thinking they don't say mom i don't like your milk i would like to have that milk with the that cute baby on it <laughs> or they don't say mom you put that blanket on me it has butterflies on it i'm a boy god for god's sake give me something with the blue dinosaurs on it <laughs> there are no concepts like that right same way you can feed them any food as long as long as it agrees with their stomach they are fine it could be cow's milk goat milk mother's milk formula doesn't matter so there are no preferences liking and disliking doesn't exist right it's a big one there is no liking there is no disliking liking later on becomes love disliking becomes hate there is no love there is no hate automatically no liking no disliking they don't want any more than they need so once their stomach is full if some mother try to force more milk they'll regurgitate right so the wanting more is not there it's not like this so oh, mom that was yummy let me have some more i'm going for second and third and fourth and what not <laughs> so there is no buffet there <laughs> so they eat for physiological reasons not for psychological reasons right so wanting more is not there wanting more to me is greed there is no greed hence there is contentment 
Does this baby think about uh, his or her past? Doesn't exist, right? Is she worried about her future? Is mom going to be around for the next feed or not? Maybe not. Let's hold on to her. Where are you going? <laughs> right? Baby is not thinking at all. There is no past. There is no future. There are no preferences, no liking, no disliking, no wanting more. They don't say, you know, seeing somebody, oh, look, he's a black person. Look, he's a white person. Look, and this and no interpretation, right? No judging. Oh, here's a homosexual. Oh, here's a heterosexual. Here's a Republican. Here's a Democrat. None of that goes on through that mind, right? That's why that mind is in the now. No past, no future, no judging, no greed, just purely in the now. And you can see that through the eyes of that newborn babies. First few days, you can see that. Pure innocence. So that's the real I. Or you could call it real human nature. Why? Because everyone is born with this. We are confused about human nature. We think killing is human nature. Not true. <laughs> and we'll come to that. If you want to see true human nature, observe little babies. They, are, they have no concepts. And later on, all the killings that humans do is along the lines of concepts, religious concepts, political concepts, what not. So killing is not human nature. Human nature is what we just observed. Living in the now, having no past, having no future, no judging, no love, no hate. Love is not human nature either. No hate, no love. No preferences, no greed, no profiling, just living in the now automatically. Once your basic physical needs are met, that's important. So that's the true human nature you, me and everyone else on the planet is born with. That's the real I. Now what happens to this real I? Gradually, the same, this real I is as if replaced by another I. It doesn't get replaced, but I'm just using the word. Or there's another I that develops inside you and it keeps getting bigger and bigger as you grow up in a society. I call it acquired self as compared to original self that we are born with. I call it acquired self because we acquire it as we grow up in a society. We acquire it from society. And one of the earlier things that we acquire is our name. So it's right from your birth, your parents start saying, Susie, Susie, you have to do it, you know, God knows how many times. Initially, you don't pay any attention, you're just looking like this. Susie, uh, okay. And at some points, it clicks. Susie, oh, that's who I am. You start responding to that sound, which in fact is a sound. And you start responding as if that's who you are. So that's the birth of virtual I, or the birth of this acquired self, the virtual I. And then of course, you gradually learn language, slowly, and initially it's just simple words, like water, and it's useful, practical, So that's 
every word basically is a sound and you attach a concept to that and it becomes word, right? So, water is sound. You attach a concept to it and it becomes water. Now, for the same object, there are different words in different languages. <coughs> so, that's what word is, basically sound. But then you attach a concept. Concept is never real. This is important to understand. Now, sound is real, but concept that is attached to it is never real. It's concept, it's virtual. Now, Susie is a sound, but the concept that I am Susie, that I is virtual. Same way like water, you can say water. Same thing, you can, ca you can call aqua or pani. Those are three words that I know for the same thing. There are 20, 30 or more others, right? It's the same thing, but different words, different sounds attached to that. So, in real, every word is a sound and it becomes word when you attach a concept to it. <coughs> and this is the a word is the building block of language. So, as we grow up in a society, we are learning more and more words, more and more concepts, right? As you go through schooling, we are learning all kinds of concepts through language. And that's important. In order to function in the society, we need to learn that. Otherwise, we won't be able to function in the society. So, we learn all these concepts, but what happened it gets out of hand. As we learn more and more concepts, it becomes dysfunctional. Like initially, two, three years old, using simple phrases, I'm thirsty, I need water, I'm hungry, this and that, very useful. But the same baby as a teenager is very dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> right? And even later on, it's very, very dysfunctional. So, this acquired self, it has in the center virtual I, which is in the form of your name, and then it has layers and layers of concepts around it. Initially, those concepts are very functional, but as we grow up in a society, we continue to acquire more and more and more concepts, so this onion keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and at some point, it becomes dysfunctional, and that some point starts very early, actually, and it's getting even earlier and earlier. So, even kids at the age of six and seven are becoming dysfunctional now. And uh, it's because uh, the information that they are getting is a whole lot more than you and me did when we were uh, five, six years old. And we did more than our parents did when they were five, six years old. So, it's with every generation, uh, we are getting more and more information starting at an earlier age. And we think it is a cool thing. That's the sad part about it. So, uh, the earlier you start getting into these concepts, uh, the sooner you start having dysfunctional aspect of it. That's why we are seeing so many kids with the ADHD in elementary school. It's kind of sad. Uh, what it is, you know, they are growing up with their mom and dad's uh, iPhones, and they are <laughs> I've seen, we all have seen that. And uh, at the age of one or two years, that's what they are doing. In addition to getting all these, uh, we used to get those stories uh, in the form of book, you know, when we were seven, eight years old. Now they are seeing all those uh, video games when they are two years old. <laughs> so all that sensory load get on their brain and just brain is uh, not mature enough to handle all that. And so that's how I look at ADHD. 
the problem is the sensory overload. And uh, so we don't look at that as the cause, we try to fix it with a drug, so, and that's how it is. This is just one example. So this acquired self, gradually it gets in the driver's seat, and as a teenager and grown up, uh, it controls our thoughts, it controls our emotions, and it controls our actions. So that's what I meant earlier, is as if it steals our identity, true identity. Now, we have a past, we have a future, we almost never live in the now, we are judging every person, every situation, we continuously saying, I like it, I don't like it, I love it, I hate it, right? We are continuously saying, better than, worse than, and we are never ever satisfied. Contentment is gone, we are always seeking more. So this uh, acquired self is uh, upbringing, as if you can say, or its development uh, takes place generally along uh, four lines. One is competition. You see that in elementary schools starting right there, or even earlier, even in kindergarten, uh, preschool, I'm seeing that now, competition starts. Comparison. And competition starts even at home with brothers and sisters, siblings. And then there's comparison starting very early age at home. Why can't you be like your older brother John? What's wrong with you? <laughs> so look at uh, Liz. She's a whole lot smarter than you. This and So that comparison goes on very early. And, and in school, everything is about competition and comparison, isn't it? All grading is competition and comparison. Everyone wants to be popular, everyone, everyone wants to be having grade A plus and what not, you know. So it's continuous competition and comparison throughout schooling. And actually, uh, if you look at competition, for example, so you got, uh, you are into academics and you got that, you know, A plus or uh, at the end of your, you know, high school, you got enough, you know, whatever grades that you were able to go to Stanford. So what do you get in response? You get this applause, right, from everyone. You're standing at that podium with your principal of high school, and here are ten valedictorians. That give them give them a uh, hand of applause, right? What does that do? At that moment, you are king of the hill, and and I was there, so I know the feeling. <laughs> you are it. You have arrived, right? Everyone is clapping. There's thrill. There's excitement, right? And then it goes away. Next day, you are nobody. <laughs> now you want more. So you are you, in in your college. Then you try to do same kind of feeling again. So, so this is just one line where you try to excel. You try to get that, you know, A plus again. So you can get applaud from your parents or from your uh, peers. And then you get that feeling again. Thrill and excitement, it goes away. So all your life, you are seeking, you are chasing this ghost of success. And each time you get a, some achievement, you get that thrill and excitement, right? And actually, this is a thirst that is never quenched. There is never ever enough success that can quench it. That's why you become highly successful because one success is not enough. You keep going up the ladder. And once you achieve over there, then you have to stay number one. <laughs> That's another struggle. Yeah. You have to stay number one in tennis. Now, how much struggle is that? 
as Pete Sampras, or you have to stay number one doctor in the county. Now, that's a lot of struggle. Anything, you have to, number one actor, number one this. So, even when you have achieved that number one level in the world, or the richest person in the world, I guess Bill Gates have that struggle too. <laughs> so, even at that, to stay number one is very uh, stressful. Point being that that thrill and excitement is what drives us. It's an addiction and we can't get enough of it. Now, on the other side, in life, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So, you didn't get to Stanford. You didn't even get uh, to accept it in any good university. You could barely go to uh, a college. Or you're in a game. And it's the same thing. When you win, everyone is applauding. You get thrilled. When you lose, then you feel pretty worthless, right? So, that's how life is. Sometimes you win, you get applause, you get thrill and excitement, and sometimes you lose, and at that time you are feeling worthlessness. I'm a loser. I'm nobody. So, you keep accumulating these emotions of thrill and, and excitement and ego. I'm very special. And then, intermixed with emotions of worthlessness, failure, loser. And this continues to build up a tower of emotions. This is what competition does. And comparison does the same thing. Now, the third thing that uh, drives our conditioning of the mind or building of this acquired self is uh, Role description, how everyone should and shouldn't behave in the society. That software gets downloaded into us at very early age. How a good boy will behave, how a good daughter will behave, how a good husband should and shouldn't behave, how a good teacher should and shouldn't behave, right? So, there is a society writes a role description for every member living in it. How a good doctor should and shouldn't behave, right? How a good president should and shouldn't behave is for everyone there is a role description, right? Now, what does this do? This role description creates expectations, obviously. How someone should and shouldn't behave is the basis of expectation. I expect my attorney, my brother, my wife, my teacher, my doctor to behave in certain way and not to behave in certain ways, right? The basis of expectations. Now, what happens when your expectations are not met? You get annoyed. And in a more uh, severe form, you get upset and angry, right? I mean, just an example. I mean, uh, uh, you uh, expect uh, your uh, wife to be loyal to you and you find out that she's cheating on you. <laughs> How do you feel? Angry, right? So, or same way you expect your, your dad to be a nice person and nurturing and, and he's not. He's a control freak and uh, you start having, uh, giving you all kind of stress and is totally egocentric and doesn't listen to you at all. You say, this is not what I expect from my father. He ought to be a nice loving person, right? So, who got hurt? You. You get annoyed, you get upset. So, this is what expectations, where they come from, is this role description. 
that every one of us has as we grow up in a society. It is part of the acquired self. So here's another thing that this role description does. Let's just call it the book of role description, just for the sake of communication. I'm not referring to any book, by the way. <laughs> it's just easier to just communicate. So, society writes down how everyone should and shouldn't behave. So, this becomes the basis of expectations as well as judging others. Oh, look at that driver. <coughs> he shouldn't be driving like this. He's crazy. Or look at that teenager, you know. He's just not right how she's doing. Look at her, you know. Uh, look at her dress, you know. That, that's not right. Or uh, look at this doctor. He's not wearing tie right way, you know. He's, he has turned his right, his tie uh, upside down. I don't know. <laughs> Once I was told that your tie doesn't match your shirt. Do you know that? Okay? Just little examples. How you expect based on this role description. How you judge everyone based on role description. Oh, he's not a kind person. He's not uh, intelligent. Oh, he is this. Oh, he is a nerd. He is that. Why are we doing all that? Because we have this information. If, it's a, if a person behaves this way, he's a nerd. If he behaves this way, he's cool, right? <laughs> it's all role description in our head. He dresses in this way, he's cool. He dresses this way, he's nerd, right? Or oh, this is the right code of ethics. This is the right code of dress. And this is not. It even goes beyond this. This is the basis of all morality. All morality comes from this book of role description. All how a husband or a wife should and shouldn't behave comes from this. You must always tell the truth. You must never lie. It gets drilled into our heads, right? So all morality comes from this book of role description and it's written by humans. Every society writes its own book of role description. That's why what is right in one society may not be right in another society because every society writes their own code of ethics, their own book of how everyone should and shouldn't behave. Then another thing happened because of this book. Self-criticism. And that's big for a lot of good people, so-called, what we call good people. It's a big one for them because they expect themselves to behave in a certain way. And what if you are able to be a perfect dad nine out of ten times, but that one time you weren't? You couldn't for whatever reasons. And if you are totally in the grip of that, how a good dad should and shouldn't behave, you'll be criticizing yourself for the rest of your life for that one time you weren't there for your child. Right? So the, this book is the basis of guilt. You harbor that guilt for the rest of your life. Self-criticism and guilt, that comes from this book of role description. So this is what this book does. Expectations, which leads to annoyances, frustrations, anger, judging others, 
and in a way trying to control their behavior or you are a teenager and uh, you, are, you are still my son, you are a good son and you should behave this way and not this way or to be a good husband, good father, good friend, you should behave this way and not this way. And in a way, we are trying to control other person's behavior. That I wish you were a good husband. I wish you were a good wife, right? What are we trying to convey? That behave in this way and not in this way. So we are trying to control other person's behavior. And we are, when we are unable to control their behavior, we get annoyed and frustrated. And that's one of the biggest problem in most relationships whether husband and wife, whether uh, brother, sister, uh, children, parents, doctor, patients. I mean, we are always in relationships with each other. And in all those relationships, we are having expectations and we are trying to control other person's behavior one way or the other. And if we are unable to, then we get annoyed. Make sense? And the third thing this book does is, uh, is the basis of self-criticism and guilt. And no amount of forgiveness will take care of it. No amount of love and this and that will take care of it. If you are totally in the grip of how I should and shouldn't behave and you didn't behave in certain way that you were supposed to, you will feel that the scar will be there forever. And that guilt is one of the most sinister scars which is there. You can't even talk to other people about it. That's how bad that is. It ultimately leads to depression, suicide, all kind of things, addictions. So when these emotional pains, they become so deep, that even if, you know, just uh, going to psychologists and psychiatrists and preachers and whatnot uh, doesn't work uh, in the long run, then uh, sooner or later people uh, run to other stuff like drugs and excessive partying or excessive sex or gambling or whatnot. Uh, so those are all escapes or illicit drugs or even medical prescription drugs. So you become addicted to different things just to get little relief from that emotional pain that has been building ever since you were a little child, it just keeps building. So we have observed the composition of this acquired self so far. In the center, there's virtual I and all kind of concepts around it. And primarily, uh, those are focused on uh, competition, comparison, book of role description, and a fourth one is entertainment. That's the whole world is uh, in the grip of it now. <laughs> And it's, it's getting, uh, it's expanding rapidly. And uh, so this acquired self, it wants to be entertained or it is bored. And there's not enough entertainment during 24 hours. It's just not enough. It just wants more, as simple as that. So uh, it's never satisfied. It just wants more more entertainment, more money, more success. Just continue to chase those goals. So this is uh, uh, how this virtual eye or acquired self is. It has huge, huge layers of concepts. We have just touched few broad categories. And it's in everyone's head. And collectively, humans have created 
what I call collective acquired self or virtual human world. What we call world actually is not real, is conceptual. For example, in real, I'm not Dr. Zaidi, I'm a life form, right? But in the conceptual world, I'm Dr. Zaidi. In the conceptual world, we have city of Ventura. In real, if you have a five years old kid who has never heard the word Ventura, you drive him around everywhere, all he will see is roads, buildings, people, hills, sky, ocean, beach, right? What he will not see is Ventura, right? He has to have that concept given to him. This is what we call Ventura. And it has its functional side, but of course it's not Ventura. So Ventura is the concept, again, name and a concept attached to it. So is every city in the world. So is every country in the world. In real, it is one planet, right? So, if you are like five years old and you are sitting, for example, uh, on the windows uh, seat of this airplane and you go from here to India, for example, what are you going to see? You're just looking right there through the window. What are you going to see? You're going to see sky, clouds, mountains, some water there. If plane gets a little low, you're going to see some roads, some buildings, right? What you will not see is, this is where California ends, this is where Texas starts, this is where France ends, this is where Turkey starts. You will not see that. You keep looking out from the window, you will see one continuous landscape which keeps changing. But everything is real, right? Sometimes mountains, sometimes water, sometimes buildings. It just keeps changing, but it's there, everything real. But then you look inside the airplane. Now there's a big screen and there are lines on it. There you see country, there you see cities, right? So this is virtual conceptual on the screen and what you're seeing in real is real, right? So. We live in two worlds. One is the real world, planet, one planet, planet Earth, all kind of things on it, mountains, trees, oceans, roads, buildings, animals, plants, what not, right? That's all real. And then we have human virtual world in which there are countries, cities, different people, different religions, different nationalities, different cultures. And on top of that, then we all have the screen. So we are looking through the screen. Now whatever is on the screen is of course not real, right? So if you're watching a basketball game on a screen, of course there are no human in that screen, right? It's very simple. So, you are seeing uh, some pictures, images, but we don't think of them as images, you know. I mean, if I'm watching a Lakers game, I'm not thinking of that just as images. It won't be no fun, right? So, uh, we know the name of every player and we know the name of uh, uh, which game it is, and in order to enjoy, I mean, you are totally sucked up into that, and we are 100% into that everything is real, right? And same is true about any movie. You're watching a news, any event, anything on the screen, you never think that this is not real, it's just image, right? Or it's no fun. I mean, it grabs our attention, 
and then we really uh, believe that this is real. The moment we believe this is real, that triggers emotion. And it adds to the pile of our emotional uh, tower as we are building. So next time you are watching anything on the screen and uh, and you are really into it, just imagine you are getting thrill, excitement, sadness, anger. It depends upon what they are showing. Fear. It all depends what they are showing. And that's where, you know, a lot of my patients tell me that it's hard, very hard for them to go to sleep after watching 10 o'clock news, right? <laughs> it's one main reason for insomnia. Because all those images, they don't think those are images. Something happened, you know, a thousand miles away or 500 miles away or 5,000 miles away. And they are showing all that. Uh, and to you, that is real. Why that is real to you? Because that collective acquired self of this society connects to your personal acquired self. Because it has given you, the society has given you concepts. So you can listen to it, you can communicate with it. Understand that? That's the whole idea. So you can function, initially the whole idea is so you can function in the society, but then it becomes dysfunctional when you are watching that YouTube videos one after the other, or you are on the Facebook for hours, or you are watching one movie after another. Now, at that point it becomes dysfunctional. Because all you are doing is you are in the grip of your emotions. All kind of emotions, fear, thrill, excitement, all those just one after the other. And you are having huge rush of adrenaline through your body. And that huge amount of adrenaline is causing your blood sugar to go up, making your blood, sh uh, blood pressure go up, it's causing uh, uh, your uh, arteries to narrow. And it's, if it is a lot of fearful stuff, it's making your uh, immune system to go haywire and you are at high risk for having autoimmune disorder. Now here's a real story. Uh, back in 1988, I don't know how, yeah, it's an older crowd, so you remember 1988, mm -hmm. except for this guy maybe. So uh, I was in Detroit, and Detroit, I used to be a big NBA fan, and uh, Detroit Pistons uh, for the first time got in the NBA Finals. Uh, it was a big deal for the whole city of Detroit. Now, talk of collective acquired self. The whole collective acquired self was in big thrill. The whole city. Finally, we are uh, uh, NBA final and we were playing Lakers. And the game went all the way to game seven. The series went to game seven. Nothing can be more exciting, right? Game seven with Lakers and... Uh, so I was in the hospital and I was a resident, senior resident, and I had like five, six uh, uh, junior doctors under me. So we were on call on, on that day. And it's like, no way we're going to miss this game. <laughs> <laughs> so they all came to me and they said, can we finish our work before six o'clock and then we can watch the game? I said, sure, why not? And I said, we'll just, I'll just keep my beeper on for emergencies and we'll all watch the game. And that's what we did. In the last 15 minutes, none of us was sitting on the chairs. <laughs> With every basket that went in, we'll go up, and every basket that went against us will go down. <laughs> Honestly, it's amazing when you're totally into it. And with, with that kind of drill going on and all kind of screaming and all kind of things going on there and all kind of gestures and this and that, uh, it came down to the last five seconds. And uh, now Pistons are winning by one point. Last few seconds. And of course, you know, you could smell that victory for the first time. We are all up and we are all just jumping. It's like game is over. And suddenly, uh, Dennis Rodman commits a foul. Okay. And he's on the Detroit Piston side. And who uh, throws the balls, you know, for that foul from Lakers side? 
Kareem Abdul Jabbar, who had almost never missed any free throw. His, his record was like over 95%. So this big guy comes and bloop, went in and bloop, another one went in. And we lost it by one point. Can you imagine the agony? I mean, the whole room was filled with pain and agony and everyone was cursing Dennis Rodman. <laughs> I mean, if he was around in front of us, somebody should have shot him, I'm sure, you know. The poor, and the whole drama is going on. And suddenly my people went off. I responded. It was from ICU. One of the patients was watching the game and at that very moment he had a heart attack. Oh. True story. Okay. So talk about the impact of all these thrill and excitement yeah. and all the emotions. They have impact on your body. Okay. So that's why we have so much emotional stress because we are in the grip of this acquired self and we think that this human world is real. I mean, you could never tell me that Dennis Rodman is not real or that game is not real. No way, I'll argue with you. How could you say NBA is not real and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is not real and Lakers aren't real? No way, okay? Same is true about whatever uh, uh, sports or movies, whatever you are in. Uh, for example, you are watching Oscars, right? And you are a big time movie goer. Now, people throw Oscar uh, watching uh, parties, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Oh, I don't know. I, I haven't watched for a long time now. I used to be, yes. So, so you are sitting and it's all preparation and you are watching, you know, the whole drama goes on. And... Um, now, if you are really into it, when that award comes for best actor <laughs> and, and you have your favorite, so they have five nominees and you have your favorite, he should win or he shouldn't win. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, they announce and if he's the one that you picked, you are jumping, right? And if he's the one that you didn't want to be, you are upset. And on the, on the screen, the guy, the best actor, he comes and uh, he's holding that metal piece as if it is something more than metal piece, of course. For him, that moment of fame and glory and success has arrived <coughs> and he delivers a speech, right? For him, that's the moment of that being king of the hill, the ultimate thrill and excitement. And that fades away. And all the other four, of course, they are upset. They are able to have a fake smile on their face, but deep down, they are, they are sad. They didn't win. And you are watching this, and then there is, you know, best actress and the best movie. And for three hours, you are going through this whole emotional roller coaster. And to you, that is real. How, how could anyone say that Robert Redford is not real? No way. <laughs> Julia Roberts, real? Absolutely. I know her. I know all of her movies. And so I absolutely, I know everything about Julia Roberts, right? So that's the virtual world I'm talking. Just few examples. We are immersed in virtual world. And when our attention is in the virtual world, it, it is not in the real world. And that's why we don't live in the now. I'm sure all of you must have heard that live in the now and there will be no stress. And it's very true. Then what prevents us from living in the now is our acquired self. Our acquired self, we could call it the baby monster and the collective acquired self as the papa monster out there. And it's in the form of TV, newspaper, books, uh, all kind of tablets, iPhones, smartphones, everything, right? So that's how that collective papa monster of the society is feeding the baby monster sitting in my head. Got it? Yeah. 
that's how it is and as long as these two are connected as long as my attention is sucked up by this acquired self in my head and is connected to this collective acquired self of the society to all these gadgets i'm not in the now i cannot be in the now because your attention can be either in the real world or in this virtual world that's the reason we don't live in the now that's the reason we don't have that that inner peace the bliss uh, that a newborn baby has that's why we have so much emotional stress in our life so you real you is looking through this virtual eye so the real eye is looking through the virtual eye and the virtual eye is continuously creating emotional stress and who is experiencing that emotional stress is real you the real eye why do i say that the acquired self is in your brain is in your head full of concepts emo- all memories everything and uh, through neuro anatomy neuro anatomy we know that there is a center in the brain called limbic system where which is the center of your emotions so emotions are generated in your head or where do you feel your emotions here that's where your true self the real i lives so your acquired self your conditioned mind is creating emotions and your real self is experiencing them as if the real self is the innocent bystander and this acquired self is like a dragon that is spitting stains on this innocent bystander <laughs> innocent and these are the spits of emotions and this poor real self it just there <laughs> carrying all that emotional burden that's why you feel those emotions who is feeling the emotion is real you and this virtual i is creating all the emotional drama people confuse the two and that's where this confusion come that violence is human nature is not let's look at violence for example violence is human killing each other right at fight why are they at fight this use logic why are they at fight because they are divided right humans are divided into nations they are divided along religious lines they are divided along cultural lines so whenever they are divided one group is fighting with another group as simple as that so what is the basis of division concepts religious nationalistic political concepts why why republicans are fighting with democrats in the same country they are divided right and then one country is fighting with another country they are divided along national lines and then within the same country people are fighting along religious lines right so the basis of division are concepts and who creates concepts society is the part of acquired self we are not born with this so therefore violence yes is the nature of the acquired self it's not the nature of the true self okay so that's where the when you confuse real world with the virtual world that's when you're going to hear this kind of uh, statements so one thing that i find very very useful uh, for my own inner peace is keeping a distinction between virtual world and real world and i live in both 
So I know I'm a life form, but in my office, I'm Dr. Zaidi. Okay? Here I'm not. So at home, I'm a father, I'm a husband. Right here, I'm not. Okay. So the real art is, the real art of stress-free living is not to run away from this virtual world of humans. You can become a monk, but then you will take that virtual world in your head and out in the forest you will be all stressed out. <laughs> so the real art is not to dislike this acquired self in your head or this human virtual world, not to dislike it, but to see it for what it is. Your acquired self is there for you to be able to function in this human virtual world, that's all. No more. When you don't need it, put it to rest. And then shift your attention into the real world, which is always around you, always. So the trick is to live in both the worlds, live in virtual world when you have to, and get out of it as soon as you don't have to. For example, you are at work, you are sitting in front of computer, that's your job. Yeah, you need to do that. But when you are at home resting, uh, what's the need to go back on the internet and chat on Facebook? <laughs> right? That's where you have to realize that I'm done with my work and it's time to live in the real world, reality. So whenever you don't need your acquired self, put it to rest. Whenever you don't need your virtual world, put it to rest and shift your attention into the now.